Awesome. So hello everyone and welcome to our conversation today. I'm here with Daniel Bowen from the Public Transport Users Association and today we're going to be talking about Melbourne Metro 2. Um, so I'm calling in today from Wurundjeri country and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi guys, I'm Daniel Bowen from the Public Transport Users Association. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Boonwarrung country. Um, I'd like also like to pay my respects to uh, elders past, present and emerging. Um, it's a beautiful day out there, so I hope you're all having a good day. Awesome, thank you so much. So today we're here to talk about Melbourne Metro 2, which is a rail tunnel that would connect the Mernda line to the Werribee line. And we're talking about this because at Friends of the Earth, our Sustainable Cities um, campaign is working with community members to really raise the profile of this rail project and to help incorporate that into um, a bit of the recovery for Melbourne's economy post COVID. So the Melbourne Metro 2 is set to create around 16,000 jobs and it'll really connect up the north and the west of the city. So I'm really pleased to be here with Daniel to talk about a bit of the ins and the outs and I guess what our, what our vision would be for um, a Melbourne where everyone is really connected. So the fundraiser that we're working on at the moment is to help keep the community campaign running. So the campaign works with communities to stop big roads projects like the North East Link and direct that money more towards public transport and active transport to help make sure that everyone has access to get wherever they need to go, as well as reducing emissions and creating jobs. So maybe we'll start off with, um, maybe Daniel, you can tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe you're the, you're the transport expert, so maybe you could give us a little bit of an overview of what Melbourne Metro 2 is and what are some of the benefits that we'll see from Melbourne Metro 2 if it's built. Yeah, um, I've, I've been fascinated by cities for a long time and, and the way they work and particularly how people get around in cities. And uh, I think what we've seen around the world is as, as cities get bigger, public transport really plays a key, plays a key role um, in, in moving people quickly and efficiently. Melbourne Metro 2 uh, is, is a tunnel, um, is, a, is a project idea that would really uh, help people move around Melbourne very quickly and efficiently um, in large numbers, but without causing a huge impact on uh, traffic congestion and the environment. So the idea is that the Mernda line up in the, in the north of uh, Melbourne would um, uh, head underground around Clif the Clifton Hill area um, head west uh, through Fitzroy and Carlton, um, an interchange at Parkville with the Metro One tunnel, uh, and then into the city via Flagstaff, Southern Cross, uh, and I hope you're familiar with all your Melbourne landmarks here as I'm just uh, dropping a list of locations. From Southern Cross, it would head west um, underneath Fisherman's Bend with a station or stations there. Uh, which Fisherman's Bend is a huge new uh, growth uh, area. Um, and then underneath the Yarra to Newport and connect with the Werribee line. Um, so it would connect the Mernda and the Werribee lines from the northeast to the southwest with a, a direct route um, underneath the city and the inner suburbs and really help connect uh, Melbourne's train network um, into new areas, uh, provide more direct. Um, uh, trips for people uh, on, on both ends of the line um, and also uh, provide a huge boost to capacity um, to which which has benefits right around the rail network for, for many of the other lines that, uh, that are currently quite um, packed with trains and packed with people uh, under normal circumstances. Um, so a, a whole obviously an expensive project but a, a whole wide range of uh, benefits would come from a big project like Metro 2 Tunnel. Realised I was muted there. Um, thank you so much for that overview. Yeah, I think it's it's important to note that it's not just going to benefit the people in the north and the west, but it'll help build capacity across the whole network, which is really, really fantastic. And at the end of the day, what we're really aiming for is for not everyone to have to own a car, right? So that there is that opportunity for people to either walk, cycle or catch public transport to where they need to go, which I think is really important to note. 
So how, how do you think this fits into the COVID-19 context? I know that there's not a lot of people catching public transport right now, but we are seeing in some places that public transport is returning. And of course, we don't want to see gridlock. So I guess, how do you see transport kind of, um, kind of recovering a little bit from the COVID drop in patronage? Obviously, right now, um, there's large numbers of people working from home or, or unable to work, you know, which is even worse. Um, and but but you you have to think that in time people will return to their workplaces, um, probably starting with the suburban uh, jobs and then later on uh, CBD office workers. And as things do get back to normal, people will inevitably get back onto public transport. Um, now, part of that is because somewhere like the CBD in particular, there is just not enough space to park all the cars. And um, even if people do want to drive, they'll quickly find that parking fees are um, very expensive. So ultimately, as people start to return to CBD jobs in particular, um, they will be looking for how to, how to make that trip and they will return to public transport. And it's important to remember that public transport is not inherently dangerous. Uh, it's not uh, in terms of COVID. The the risks of transmission have been found to be uh, over exaggerated, and particularly in a context where um, mandatory face masks are in use um, when you every time you leave your house. Um, those sorts of measures, as well as others, uh, I think, uh, are helping to ensure that public transport um, is not a transmission risk. We've seen it in studies um, around the world uh, where, where in fact the, the, the general uh, spread of COVID is, is much higher than in Melbourne at the moment. So, I mean, that's, that's obviously a factor, but I think ultimately you have, you have to think in the medium to long term, things, people will start to get back onto public transport. And of course, in the, in the longer term, as um, when eventually uh, some sort of vaccine arrives, uh, you know, we're going to see things return to a, a, a level of, of uh, commuter patronage, which is um, far closer to normal. Uh, of course, you, we may also see a change in work, pack, work patterns. We may see the work from home kind of um, trend continuing on beyond COVID, um, which uh, will alter a little bit uh, how people get around and, and whether they do travel into work every day. Um, but I, I tend to think that that's not going to be a, uh, a, the sort of change where nobody goes into the office ever. It's more likely to be um, part-time commuting or, you know, some days on, some days off or varying your, your travel times. Um, ultimately, though, Melbourne is, is a big city. It's a growing city. And when things get back on the rails, pardon the pun, um, I, th I think we will see people back on public transport, the demand will come back and um, these kind of uh, projects to boost capacity will be important again. So if anything, um, perhaps there's, there's a bit of breathing space now um, and hopefully the authorities do take advantage of that and, and push ahead with these types of projects. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good point. And I think something that really stands out for me is that before COVID, we the the public transport system really wasn't wasn't like able to get everyone to where to, where they needed to go, especially at peak hour. And I think that it's good to remember that these projects they are long term and they are going to help serve us not just now but into the future. And what kind of city do we want to see in five, ten years from now? How many people are going to be moving to Melbourne again when that um, you know immigration starts coming, you know, reaching higher levels again? It's about planning for the future. And I think that's why we're really keen on, at the moment, getting a business plan at least started for Melbourne Metro too. So we can look at the, you know, we can look at the strengths, weaknesses, how many jobs, really like hone in on like, where are this, where's it gonna be the best position for each station and all of that kind of thing so that we can make sure that, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, we do have enough capacity on our network so that we're not stuck in cars and, and gridlocked, which I think is really important to note. Your point, your point about uh, uh, what sort of city do we want is a really important one. In a, in a way, having everyone sit at home for several months is a, it's almost a form of reset uh, on some of these transport planning questions and how we 
bounce back and what we bounce back to, I think, is is a bit up in the air. And do, do our leaders actually have the vision to see, okay, well, travel patterns may change as a result of this. Um, uh, can we take advantage of that? Can we help spread peak loads on public transport across the day because more people are, are working part-time or going into the office part-time? You know, is, is there the benefit of this bad situation may be a, uh, a chance to look again at some of the um, kind of planning decisions and, and look ahead to what we do want our city to, uh, to work towards in the coming years. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good point. Yeah, and I'd love, yeah, I'd love to see a place where, you know, folks who do need to use cars, such as people with access issues, you know, tradies, all of that, where they have access to cars and they have access to the roads that they need. But everyone else, you know, using a car doesn't need to be something that is normalised. Using a car is something that, like, you know, you might use sometimes if you're going on holiday and there's, like, you know, ride share will probably become a lot bigger and that kind of thing. But it would just be so fantastic if everyone could access affordable affordable transport, you know, where they're not having to pay thousands of dollars on registration and, and, you know, petrol and all of that stuff every year. And I think for me, what I would love to see in our public transport system is all of, all of those gaps filled as well. So all those areas where, you know, there's actually no bus, tram or train um, and really make sure that, you know, everyone in Victoria has access to something, you know, within walking distance. It would just be so fantastic to see. Yeah, I mean, that's that's absolutely right. At the moment, we've got vast areas of Melbourne in, in middle the middle and outer suburban areas where you basically have no choice but to drive. And it'd be great to see projects like Metro 2 get up, but also um, uh, accompanying projects better feeder buses into the railway stations and, and town um, suburban centres uh, that help people get around for those local trips as well, which are going to become um, increasingly important, uh, I think, as as people do um, travel to kind of local workplaces and, and for their shopping and, and so on. Um, so yes, Metro 2 and those big infrastructure projects are important, but equally important are those kind of local projects around uh, increasing uh, bus services in, in the suburban areas. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really about making sure that we're integrating all of those different modes. So making it easy for people to, you know, cycle to the station. I was talking to a community member the other day and that was something she really envis envisaged for Melbourne Metro too, making sure that all of those new stations are really pedestrian friendly, bike friendly, and making sure that they also integrate with the current bus systems or, or changing those bus systems to make sure everything, you know, fits in. So you're not waiting half an hour for your bus after you get off the train and that, that kind of thing. Um, awesome. Well, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you, Daniel. Thank you so much. I'll just let everyone know again about the fundraiser. So this week, um, over the week, we're having a decentralised walk where all of the lots of volunteers at Friends of the Earth and community members such as yourself are welcome to get involved. Basically, all you do is go for a walk around your neighbourhood, take a selfie and use the hashtag um, hashtag build Melbourne Metro 2 and you can tag sustainable cities at we sustain cities and it's a sponsored walk so you can either sponsor someone who's already doing the walk or you can do the walk yourself and spread the word about Melbourne Metro 2 to your friends and family so the work we do here at Friends of the Earth we always say we run on the smell of an empty root uh, empty muesli bar wrapper it is precarious work and we do rely on the support of all of our wonderful supporters, all of the people who, you know, come along to Friends of the Earth and enjoy the food co-op and who are part of our um, part of our network. So we really appreciate any support you can give to help us continue to do this community campaigning around sustainable, accessible and safe public transport for everyone. So thank you so much for supporting and thank you so much, Daniel, for taking the time to have this conversation tonight. No worries. Thanks, Claude. Awesome.